You're ready to go. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Susie Lee, and I lead program-related investing at the WK Kellogg Foundation, and I will be the moderator for our session. It's an honor to partner again with SOCAP to host this critical conversation on rethinking risk to unlock capital and innovation. False perceptions of risk are often huge barriers for women and people of color and prevents capital from flowing equitably to talented fund managers and entrepreneurs. And our goal for today's session is for each of us to ask ourselves, how do we unlock opportunity by reframing risk? The structural paradigm that reinforce perceptions of risk requires systems change to shift. And we will learn how our panelists are disrupting the risk paradigm and paving new pathways. Structural and systemic racism are the problem that we at the Kellogg Foundation aim to tackle at every level of how we invest and who we invest in. We're focused on taking a systems approach to achieving long-term sustainable positive outcomes. And to help us achieve that, we invest in fund managers, entrepreneurs, and social enterprises across the risk spectrum through vehicles including mission-related investments, program-related investments, and grants. And you'll see that represented across our portfolio uh, that's on our panel uh, today. Uh, and, and today we've convened a dynamic group of leaders from our portfolio who are redefining risk through their work. And they're addressing the root causes of racial inequity from across the ecosystem. So let's dive in. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Malin Yen, founder and partner of Operator Collective, David Sharp, CEO of Urban Advisors, and Tim Spurlock, CEO of American Diesel Training Centers. And as a reminder to the audience, you're welcome to drop comments or questions in the chat throughout the event. And I have an opening question for all three of our panelists. Um, please open by telling us about yourself, your organization, and how are you dismantling barriers to economic opportunity? And Malin, I will turn it over to you to get us kicked off. Great. Thank you, Susie. Thanks so much for, for, for inviting me. Um, um, such an honor to be here. So I am the founder and, um, and partner of, um, of a fund that we launched in December of 2019 called Operator Collective. And first of all, I guess one of the barriers of dismantled is that I have the most unlikely background for a fund manager. I actually started out my career as an intellectual property attorney um, and have had a number of startups ever since. But um, it's folks like Kellogg who actually came in in the is the first institutional investor in Fund One that that really helps set the stage. But but what I want to do so what Operator Collective is a venture fund. It's a fifty million dollar venture fund, and what I observed as being part of the the broader venture ecosystem is the VC world tends to revolve around VCs and founders, and um, which are two very important parts of the venture ecosystem. But as you build and grow and scale any company, you need operators, people who have built, scaled, and run companies before. But the operators, which is what I mostly identify as having spent much of my life as an enterprise operator, were, the venture world was not accessible to us. And then, um, and I realized if, if, but the VCs and the founders did want to bring operators in, they just didn't overlap with our networks. And then, um, and so I built a fund that has 137 operator LPs. Um, and the operator LPs, because you tend to know people like you, have built and scaled up companies like Cisco and Stripe and, and Salesforce and beyond, but they're also 90% women, 40% people of color. And so what I wanted to do was create a natural way to bring together these networks of people that needed each other, that wanted each other, but didn't naturally intersect. Um, because we all know that forced diversity doesn't work, but if you can create something that each side needs and find a easy way to make it accessible, then 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 I knew that we could do things like expand wealth creation and literally change the face of venture from the ground up. Great. Thank you, Malin. And David, over to you. Great. So uh, David Sharp, CEO of uh, Urban Advisors. And um, from 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 our perspective, by way of background, really quickly, um, I was you know functioned as a traditional investment banker for a number of years then ran community development, the investment side within a bank, um, and then uh, launched uh, Urban Advisors, where we work with a number of impact investors, helping to design and structure funding programs and funding initiatives. And so uh, we're based in the Southeast, but most of our work was, was, was national, and actually very little was actually within the Southeast. And some of our clients really said, you know, there's upward mobility challenges within the Southeast, and we'd really like to see some more product uh, in that marketplace. And so in 2018, we designed or launched a fund called the Up Community Fund. Um, from, from those of you that remember the upward mobility study, 
um, the Southeast was um, the, the hardest hit area for folks of color. And actually one of the findings was if you were low income and you lived in the Southeast, you need to move. Um, and so uh, we didn't like that as a finding. And so the creation of the Up Community Fund, one of the things that we focus on here is we're not necessarily honing in on, on tech related companies, but we're focusing on kind of, I'm going to say the main street businesses, um, somewhat of the lifestyle businesses and traditional businesses in general. And the focus is how can we provide the right kind of capital that's flexible, that integrates with a form of advisory services we can really partner with those firms because there's a huge distrust of of institutional uh, of institutions um so if it's a bank and, which represents an institution there's a lack of trust if it's a, a you know government agency which represents an institution there's a lack of trust and so for us being a firm of color working with a portfolio of small businesses that that look like us and, and, and we can relate with them and they can relate with us um, what we wanted to do was to break down the trust factor and then begin to help them actually work through the challenges and dynamics that they have as small businesses. And so that's one of the key themes around dismantling barriers. One, they actually look to us to say, wow, there's a firm of color that actually is a capital allocator. We don't really know any of those uh, that actually is owned, authentically owned and can really make those investment decisions. Um, and then then from there, it's, hey, can I really talk to you about a real challenge that I'm having with my business? We'd rather hear that up front or along the way, as opposed to after the fact when it's too late, when nothing can be done to help. Great. Thank you so much, David. And on to you, Tim. You, you're a bit of a different, uh, you're, you're a little bit different than the other panelists here. So we'd love to hear, um, share with the I audience. Just want to say, I don't, do I have to say anything? I just want to sit here and listen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So um, good morning, afternoon, somewhere in between. My name is Tim Spurlock. Um, I'm the founder, co-founder and uh, CEO of American Diesel Training Centers. Um, I have no background in anything mechanical, and I definitely have no background in anything finance or banking related. But um, what my background is, and I was talking to Matt a little bit about it, is I spent 25 years in educational publishing, which now everybody calls educational technology. Um, and for nine years, I ran sales for a uh, I would call it a boutique global business that produced and distributed courseware for automotive and truck programs around the world. So if you were teaching people how to be mechanics, you were either using our product or we were trying to get you to use our product. So I, I've seen the trades, um, the skilled trade shortage all over the world. I did a lot of business in South Africa and I sat in South Africa at the opening of an apprentice academy and saw the CEO of Imperial Motors talk about there were no mechanics in South Africa. And I would hear the same thing in industry um, here in the United States. People would call us up. We were an educational publisher. Companies would call us up and they would say, um, we'd like to use your material. And we'd say, eh, it's really meant for an educational program. And they would say, we don't care. We're hiring people with no experience and trying to figure out how to get them trained. So I, I thought there's really an opportunity here. And, and if you really ask me, um, I say this all the time, but if you really ask me the number one reason we found at American Diesel Training Centers was that um, I just couldn't take seeing students come out of a typical technical training program in the United States, uh, specifically for-profit programs, $40,000 in student loan debt. And the interesting thing was, is that what, what every program out there, I'm talking a post-secondary community college or a technical for-profit program, they don't train for what industry wants. Um, so we decided to create a disruptor um, to do exactly that. So we founded American Diesel Training Centers um, in 2017. It's a five week intensive hands on program that we align specifically to tasks that industry wants. So think basic stuff like what you take your car in for. Right. Brakes, electrical, light diagnostic work, um, it, emissions, which is called after treatment. Um, so five weeks, 25% um, uh, of the price of the typical um, for-profit school. And in four years, we've become one of the largest producers of diesel technicians in the United States. Um, there's a couple interesting things that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. The, the, the thing that we are most proud of is that after a five-week program, 
people make $16,000 a year more than they did when they entered the program. So we are literally lifting people, um, and we have stories every class, out of the poverty level into not only um, uh, you know, a, a great industry where you never have to worry about a job, but career paths that are completely unlimited. Um, and and our, we also um, are very diverse. This is a great industry and it's open to anyone who wants to partake in it. So, so um, uh, our, our numbers are about 42% people of color, um, 58% white. Um, and so, you know, we, we really are um, super proud of the opportunities and I can sit here and tell stories forever. The opportunities that we've given to people since we've been around for four years, we've seen people who started here in 2017 and what they're doing now. And it really is just mind blowing what, what we've been able to do partnering with um, our students and partnering with great, great partners like social finance. So um, that's it, Susie. And I'll great. thank you again for, for hosting the session. Great. Thank you, Tim. And I'm going to follow up with you um, just to, um, to if you could share with the audience a bit more about that partnership with Social Finance Up Fund and, and a bit about the um, income share agreements, the career impact bond, and, and really tying it um, to this theme of, um, of de-risking um, opportunity. And, and maybe share a bit about um, the workers and the students who want to access this program, because as you've, as you've articulated, it really is a stepping stone to high quality um, good paying jobs. And so can you share a bit about um, how perhaps the barriers that students sure. face and how the, the financing partnership unlocks the. Yeah, it's, it's so we, and you know, like most startups, we tried everything. And, and the, here's the funny thing. If, if you read my original biz, our original business plan um, in 2017, we were just going to be a cottage business in Columbus, Ohio. And once we started, we started getting calls from companies all over the country. Well, can you be here? Can you, you know, can you come to Michigan again? Can you come to California? You come to Florida? Well, you know, that's a little tough for a startup. Um, but the, the, the business model was that we would charge companies just a flat fee. And in exchange for that fee, they would they would get a, a proficiently trained entry level technician. And it kind of worked. Right. It kind of worked. But we were actually more successful at recruiting students than we were um, uh, companies willing to take a risk and stroke a check for somebody who essentially was very unproven. We tried everything. We tried private student loans. We tried having students make payments. But things really came together. I mean, the complete catalyst for this business is, is when we met Tracy and the folks at Social Finance, and they created um, uh, for us a career, career impact bond. Um, which allows us to get funding for all of our students. So the way the Career Impact Bond works is, is that um, uh, we, we receive our, um, our tuition from the Career Impact Bond. There's a significant risk share as part of that. So if, if I don't do my job and produce a solid entry-level technician who stays employed American Diesel goes away. So there's a huge incentive for us to um, for us to um, produce a quality product. The beautiful thing for our students is, is that they pay no money upon entrance of the program. And then um, they actually don't start uh, paying on their income share agreement until um, uh, two months after they leave the program. So they get a really nice runway. But the beautiful thing about what we do is we 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 structured it so the payments are manageable, right? So students come out of here. Our average starting salary is around forty thousand dollars a year. Students come out of here. Their payments are, and this includes a really nice starter tool set that everybody needs. Their payments are three hundred seventeen dollars a month for four years. That's totally capped, right? At four years, it's done. So students come here. They don't have to pay any money to come to American Diesel. In fact, the Career Impact Bond also funds their travel here, and it funds their five-week hotel stay here. We put them up in a real nice all-suite hotel, and it funds $400 in um, meals. So students, students can come here. They literally don't have to go a dime out of pocket. In fact, if they manage their meal run money right, they can. Uh, they can leave with with cash. So and our placement rate is it's you know, it's 91 percent, but it's essentially 100 percent. Anybody who comes here who wants a job will end up getting hired. The cherry on top of the ice cream. And I know Susie will probably want to talk about this is that 
we've been able to really crack the code in terms of bringing in employer partners who are willing to participate in the um, in the basically the uh, the de-risking part, right? So so many of our students um, leave. They go to work for a company, and that company says, "Hey, guess what? As long as you work for me, I'm going to make that three hundred seventeen dollar a month income share agreement payment for you. As long as you work for me, right?" We mm-hmm. also seventeen percent of our students, and this thing is growing like a hockey stick. Seventeen percent of our students come in already employed by a particular company. We do recruiting, private label recruiting campaigns for those companies that advertise great opportunity, um, great career. So what we do is we we screen the applicants, we send uh, candidates to the company, and the companies hire them based on attitude and aptitude, right? And then they send them to us. So these students are being paid for training. All their expenses are handled. and the ISA payments are handled. And right now that's 17%, but our class, we just um, pushed out of Columbus here on Friday, it was 100%. Our class we had coming through in December is 75%. So you're gonna see that 17% very quickly go to 50, 60, 70%. So we really do have, we have everyone participating in this. I take a risk, the, the students take a risk or trainees take a risk by coming here the employers take risk by investing proactively in these um, in our students, and the end game is is our average student leaves here with a sixteen thousand dollar raise out of the gate, and a we consider ourselves to be a portal into the business. Like there are CEOs of trucking companies all over the place who started out as technicians. Yep. So that's the fun thing about what we do. Awesome. Thank you. That is such a great um, story of really how you're shifting the risk away from the worker and the student and really on to employers, the financing um, partner and and you as the training provider, which is, I think, really where the risk needs to be. And um, and that's unlocking um, those opportunities and breaking down barriers for uh, for workers. So thank you, Tim. Um, so shifting shifting to Malin and David, and both of your funds and organizations provide capital and resources to diverse founders, uh, women, and entrepreneurs of color. Can you share a bit about the barriers that entrepreneurs you support face and really how your model and how your support unlocks opportunity for them? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe we'll start, David, uh, with you. Okay, great. Sure. So, so, so for us, I mean, we went in with a thesis of really helping um, underserved, disadvantaged businesses, specifically businesses of color. But at the same time, we kind of got the one-two punch uh, because you know COVID hit right at, at right at that same time. And so, for us, uh, one of the things that we that we recognize is that um, I think we've all heard statistics around they were anticipating a forty to fifty percent loss of black-owned businesses. Uh, as a result of COVID. And I have to admit, out of our 16 companies, um, there was probably some point along the journey where 14 of those 16 were probably teetering on going out of business, especially based upon the combination of COVID. Um, we've, we're probably looking at maybe one or two um, at this stage that that are, are facing that potential reality, but the majority of those businesses have have weathered that storm and have made it through. We we actually helped the majority of our companies secure secure PPP financing. Um, and so what happens is a is a fund manager is that you know there's no quote unquote drawing a line in the sand. It's like whatever your portfolio company needs is what you wind up finding yourself doing. So we were beginning to function as co-CEOs, co-COOs. CFOs and we would walk dogs on the weekend for some of the portfolio of managers if we needed to. And so, but as a result of, of, of that really being in the trenches, really working with these companies, I mean, the things that we saw as, as themes that were repeatable for the process was, you know, bookkeeping without question was a challenge for every single company. I mean, there's just, there's no way around it. We actually had to bring a bookkeeper on our team and we'll probably add another one or two to just come in at the very beginning and help the companies migrate through the process as it relates to bookkeeping and financials. Um, another another area is you know bringing in someone who can really help them to 
review certain contracts. I find that when some of the small businesses get into a jam, it's, well, you know, let's, hey, here's an opportunity. Let's jump on it because we need it really quick. And no one's really reviewed any of the documents. And so they find out that they get into a really bad deal. Um, for a lot of the companies, we had to clean up their balance sheets. Uh, you know, as you're a struggling business, you know, you're you're reaching for whatever source of financing you could get your hands on. And so, you know, predatory lending, it, you know, to me or on some of the online lending, you know, the metaphor I used with the portfolio companies, it's like crack cocaine. It's like, I mean, I've never used it, but it's just a metaphor that, um, you know, feels really good for a few minutes. And uh, and after that, you know, it's it's a really difficult situation to work yourself out of. And so that became an area that we really began to work with negotiating with some of those predatory lenders to to get them to settle on some type of amount to help them clean up their balance sheets. Some of them may have had some some tax challenges that needed to be cleaned up. Uh, and so we found that there was a lot of kind of, you know, a lot of as, as, as these entrepreneurs, a lot of them are, were undercapitalized. They didn't necessarily have the staff. And so, you know, they're just focusing on keeping the lights on. But when you strip it away, a number of them really had good businesses. And, and Timothy, uh, to the point that you mentioned earlier, we got a couple of companies that are in the trucking space and, um, you know, going to some of these, you know, some of these more majority firms to get a truck repaired. The prices are ridiculous and they'd love to have somebody on their staff that can come in and do some of those repairs at a much lower cost. So I'm, I'm connecting it to some of the folks here on, on the uh, on the panel. But that that for us, I mean, between the bookkeeping, between helping them to make you know strategic decisions, beginning to talk about enterprise value. I mean, we really function more like a like a private equity fund than a credit provider, although the underlying instrument was a was a credit product because what the businesses really needed was an, an advisory capacity or relationship, but it had to be someone that had trust. And so we spent a lot of time on the front end to establish trust with the entrepreneurs so they could pick up the phone on a Sunday and said, Hey, David, I need to talk to you about, about something that's really going on. And in some cases it requires a lot of work to fix. And in some cases it's just a quick fix, but they just really didn't have anybody to collaborate with. So you want to be coming partners to the owners of the business. That's great. Thank you, David. And it just shows how so much more um, is needed beyond capital and money itself to really help these entrepreneurs uh, thrive. So Malin, the businesses and the entrepreneurs and the founders that you partner with are, are quite different uh, than the, the ones that David um, described. But can you share with us some of the some of the challenges that, um, that the founders you support um, face and really how your model is, is so unique in helping them uh, grow and thrive? Yeah, so I do enterprise software, <laughs> so so a little bit different from what you guys focus on, but I think a lot of the themes are the same, right? The risks in running any business is that when you're trying to recreate the wheel, each individual person is trying to recreate the wheel and figure it out on their own. They may have a great idea, but they any roadblock from, from lending, right, to just a, a good lawyer, um, just people who have been there, done that, you can accelerate the success of them. And so what, what we wanted to do with, um, with both, actually, when you look at how we've sort of de-risked, it's actually... The, the founders that we invest in, but it's also the um, the operators who have been left out of venture who wanted to access venture. But for us, de-risking, so let's actually talk about that first, because on the operator side, the ones who have invested in our fund, right, and then the fund invests in the founders, is that these were these highly talented, um, you know, highly skilled, highly experienced um individuals who had just not had the opportunity to invest. And investing is not just about, oh, you know, you hear about, it's like, oh, you should just angel invest, right? But angel investing and losing your money, right? When wealth creation is already concentrated amongst a single dominant homogenous group, it's not, a lot of us who are not part of that dominant homogenous group can't just angel invest and not have, you know, and not have that, you know, uh, and, and just do it in ultra risky investment. So what I wanted to do was make it easy and safe, right? And a way of not every single one of these operators trying to recreate the wheel to learn how to angel invest, how to source companies, so the efficiencies. And then second, when you invest, you want to have a portfolio. So me as an individual operator, maybe I can't do 20 or 30 investments. I maybe can do one or two. Which is uh, which is not diversification, but through the through our fund, they can actually they invest in obviously all the companies that we've invested in because they've invested in our fund. Um, second, on the operator side, even though there's all these ultra talented, mostly women and people of color, seventy percent of them have never invested in venture before. 
our fund was the very first time. And when we asked them, they said, well, no one asked. I didn't know how to engage and, you know, didn't have time, et cetera. And then so the, the, so our fund actually invests in founders from all backgrounds. We don't just invest in women and people of color, but what we also knew is because you have these naturally more diverse networks from the deal flow that we get from our operators and others that our, um, uh, our, you know, our, our founders do tend to be, um, especially in enterprise software, which tends to be very homogenous. Um, our founders actually tend to be um, more from more diverse backgrounds. So 70% of our founders um, have, a, um, have a founder of color. Um, um, almost 40% of our CEOs are founders of color. And then also with respect to, to women, 48% um, of our companies have a female founder um, almost 40% actually have a female CEO. And um, <laughs> this was not intentional, but um, but it actually um, over, you know, almost 25% of our companies have actually about all female founding team. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when you can, when you can, when you can, you know, de-risk, make it accessible for this group of ultra talented operators to come in, then you necessarily have a broader lens in which to invest in these founders who you might not have access to. And then so for these founders, it's a lot of what David and Tim, Timothy are doing, which is how do you how do you reduce the risk by we have, a you know, 137 individual operators who have all built and scaled up companies. Some of them are founders as well. And all of their networks that we can tap as they grow and scale their company, because you need different things at different stages of the companies. And so that's what we do with our with our founders as well, which is we make sure that we only invest in values aligned founders who we believe the world is are going to make the world a better place by treating people well, having great cultures and also um, obviously being ultra successful because this is about expanding wealth creation beyond the same you know group of which you know wealth has tended to 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 circulate. And um, mm -hmm. and it's fun. And I'll just share a couple of um, stats, which is um, I this is a first time fund for me. I'm a first time fund manager. And a lot of people, a lot of people believed in this idea, even though I didn't have the traditional background of, 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 of venture, um, including Kellogg, like I said, who, who came in as the first institutional investor and really made a huge difference. But since we've started the fund, um, we've been investing for um, about uh, about two and a half years. Um, we have, you know, the deal IRR is almost um, is over 80 percent of the 11 core companies we invested in prior to 2021. Ten, 10 have raised follow on rounds. 11 of them were or 10 companies have raised follow on rounds. Um, 10 of them were actually also preemptions, meaning that they weren't even raising and the increase in market valuation from the time that we first invested to the last round valuation um, increase is over seven billion dollars. So, so this works um, because uh, it, this works because there are people like Kellogg and others who believe that this is an idea that could work. And then the trickle down effect of what folks like you guys do, you know, through the wealth creation that we're doing for the operators and now to the founders that, that perhaps we can, you know, help see around the corners a little bit faster, right? As these guys know, we can't do it for them. But what we can do is make it a whole lot easier and remove those barriers and then hence reduce the risk because ideas are great, but execution is a challenge, right? It's hard. And yeah. that's where most of these companies actually end up falling apart. It's not in the initial ideation phase. It is, okay, now we're on to something. How do we hire? How do we do this? And so um, I'm incredibly grateful for uh, for the support of folks like you and then totally see um, and so in awe of what David and Timothy are doing, um, you know, in their industries. That's great. Thank you so much, Malin. And um, maybe, D David, I'll um, uh, go back to you to see uh, Malin shared some of these really great examples of how all yeah. of the wraparound support really drives growth, drives impact, drives returns. Are there anecdotes or examples that you'd like to share around how your unique model has really helped um, drive impact and, um, and returns uh, for the entrepreneurs that, that you support? Yeah, great, great. Yeah. Uh, so so we, we've deployed you know, $10 million into, into 16 companies. And, um, you know, I'll give you one company that actually is in the e-commerce space. And, uh, when this young lady, um, and 40% of our portfolio are, are women, 60%, um, are males, uh, and hundred percent actually are African-American. Um, and so, um, with that being said, uh, the one example of a company in the e-commerce space, um, this particular, uh, a woman, um, was probably making a hundred dollars a day, uh, when we first connected with her, 
she is currently uh, in the process of wanting to sell her business to, to realize enterprise value. And it's probably looking at a valuation of close to a million dollars. So this is a, an individual that went from really, you know, just just day to day survival to now enterprise. Right. And, and so that becomes like part of our discussion through through, through, through our process uh, with some of our portfolio companies. We had one company that um, had had taken a hit when they when we were introduced to them. They were in the medical space and they had their revenues had went as low as, as almost you know, call it two thousand dollars a week, and uh, and she was on on the brink of going out of business. And we funded her, provided a lot of the support, and she's probably you know north of a hundred thousand dollars a week right now. And so, and she's and she's wondering is her next steps? Does she take you know a traditional round of capital to really you know ramp up her operations, or does she think about exit? Or is it just a straight a straight kind of distribution model for her? And how can she grow and expand into other markets? So um, those those to me represent areas where I feel like it's really powerful. We have one company in a portfolio that's actually in the asphalt business. Um, and, and this particular individual uh, actually cashed his checks at a cash checking uh, place. And that was the and that was basically was his bank. And and he went from really kind of running the business just from, you know, checks going in and money coming out to now he's talking about ratios. He's talking about, you know, I want to build a business for my family. He's got three new family members that he's brought into the business over 18 months. You know, he's, he's, he's picking up more, con his backlog is probably two, two, three million dollars. When we first met him, his backlog was maybe $20,000, right? And so you see the transformation in the mindset of those individuals. And, you know, and, 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 and I think what's powerful about it is you can just hear the inspiration, you know, in their voices as they're starting to get some of these wins along the way. And like, I think the comment was made, it's all about execution. And, um, and I totally, I totally agree with that because you can't do it for them, but sometimes just knowing that they've got a resource there, uh, we have something called the up community, uh, the up, the up community fund village. And what we do with that, we would have quarterly to semi-annual conference calls, and we would encourage our portfolio companies to work together. Uh, go after a contract together, or if somebody found a good insurance resource to share that so someone doesn't have to, you know, experience hard knocks unnecessarily. If someone's looking for, you know, a contact in the state of North Carolina so they can go after a job, well, there's somebody else in the portfolio who has a relationship. And so we, we really can encourage that notion of we're a collective family and nobody wants to live in a, in a gated community with one house. So if we can raise up another enough small businesses, they now can talk about wealth creation strategies uh, and really lift each other up, which helps to lift their companies, their employees and the ecosystem. That's great. Thank you so much, David and Malin, both of you really describing how access to networks and expertise and that mentorship and peer support and, and building community uh, for the entrepreneurs um, you support really contribute to their growth and their success and, and, and de-risking them as enterprises. Um, would like to shift back, uh, Tim, to you um, and um, you know, according to recent reports, you know, there are currently 10 million unfilled jobs in the U.S. and more than 8.4 um, million unemployed people in the U.S. And what you're doing is really bridging that gap. So can you share a bit more about the big vision around, you know, what what would you say to other investors and company leaders, you know, about the importance of um, the career impact bonds and, and this concept of income share agreements to really, again, unlock that pathway to um, to employment. Uh, you know, you've got a lot um, of, of a big vision around how to scale um, your your company and would love to uh, share that with the audience in terms of what's possible and and um, and how to break down some of the barriers and and unlock um, that financing. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's it's a great question. And, you know, I mean, we I think the the one of the key things that we identified, and it's it's so right in front of you, is that there are millions of people, millions and millions of people in this country. We see them every day. I've, I've got a group of them, two hundred feet from me, out in the shop. They're working really hard, 
but they're working, we say they're in high effort, low skill, low wage jobs. And there are two options right now don't work for them. The, the two biggest barriers that we've broken through are, in general, people in our average age is 26 years old. Um, 38% of our, of, of, our, of our students, trainees have children, right? The two biggest barriers are time and money. In today's world, the typical American doesn't have time for a two-year community college program, and they sure don't have $40,000 plus to go to a technical school. So that's really what we, what we were able to do was to partner with industry. We knew we had the educational model nailed. Um, one of our first meetings, literally, we, I don't know, we barely had a building was with the top three people at FedEx, right? So, and, and we identified, and it's, this just isn't diesel technicians right now in this country, there are at least a hundred thousand openings for diesel technicians, but there are industries all over the place that are very similar. Um, Tracy talks about it all the time. I think, yeah, as you may say, I think there's 7 million middle skill jobs, which they're a little bit after high school, but not a post-secondary degree. That's really the niche that we figured out is that we just figured out how to move people on a much quicker pathway. Our pathway is five weeks from $22,000 a year to between thirty-eight and 40000 And we, we, we have a kid who graduated four years ago. He's making just under six figures right now. And he's running an entire service operation for the largest truck dealer group in the United States, publicly traded. Well, like I said, I could tell stories like this all the time. So it's the it's the pathway. Now the problem and and which is why we we chose not to go the Title IV funding route. And so um, Title IV funding are basically grants, student loans, et cetera. We believe because there's a two trillion dollar student loan debt, the Title IV funding is one of the biggest challenges um, and, and causes really of of, of what we're, you know, kind of where we are right now, because so many people are so buried in debt that they working in jobs that they 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 didn't go to school for, right? So our, we were successful in basically building the model for, and then going to find, even though it was really hard. And David and Alan are totally right. Like we had some really rough weeks. We we built the model for, and then we we. We figured out how to fund it later. I don't know that I would give anybody that advice, but we've really kind of, now that we've broken through and done what we do, I guarantee you there will be other startups very similar to us in other businesses where companies looking for mechanical geniuses. They want people to who can show up, work hard, um, be willing to um, get additional training um, and fundamentally solve mechanically. I think those traits, they translate to industries way outside of uh, what we do. But the, the income share group and the, the risk share and the fact that you can come here and literally their parents don't start at worst case scenario until they've landed a job. Best case scenario, they're going to come through here get a job starting out at 40,000 plus and never making a payment on their own because the company's going to make the payment on their behalf because we've proven a rock solid ROI that that company is the greatest deal on the planet to hold our students based on the expensive rates that companies charge. Great. Thanks so much, Tim. I'm going to shift it back uh, to, to David and Malin um, to uh, begin closing us out here um, with any advice. Um, what um, what advice would you give to other innovators in how to raise unique funds like yours and really meet the needs of these entrepreneurs that you're that you're serving? Um, yeah. So so um, so for all of my life, I felt like an outsider for for lots of reasons. Um, even my first job, my first you know executive position was as chief IP counsel, focused on patents. Susan, that amazing- do we lose Mel? Oops. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you as well. Yeah. Uh, um, 
I'll, 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 and, and so, so anyway, I've always felt like an outsider from having, you know, immigrant parents who didn't speak English from, from being the only one who didn't have a technical degree, who was in the chief patent council of a major corporation to like not having really any, um, much in investing experience when I started a fund I would say lean into those differences. Because if I had tried to, um, put together a fund that looked like your typical venture fund, um, no one would have funded it. I wouldn't have funded it. Kellogg wouldn't have funded it. But instead, I focused on what do I know and how can I develop what I what I need to. And then the second thing is 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 like listen to the naysayers too. When I started to um, hear what they're saying, doesn't mean you have to. David, listen can to you them. hear me? Yes, uh, we I can. can hear you, Timothy. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so listen, um, hear what the naysayers have to say, because most of the time they mean well, but there's, uh, but I heard a lot of, you're never going to raise a fund if you do this. You're never going to raise a fund if you do this. And instead of ignoring it, understand that other people are going to have those comments too and find a way to address them, but maybe not in the traditional way that other people have. And I think those were some of the two key things that, that allowed me to put together a fund that really didn't look like, like anything else with a background that <laughs> didn't look like anyone else's either. <laughs> and we're so glad you did. <laughs> David, what advice would you want to share? Yeah. And, and so it's interesting. It's a, I'm going to say it's a, a pre-social unrest versus post-social unrest. I mean, we, we kind of raise our capital during, during the pre-social unrest. And I have to, I have to admit um, it's, it's a different dynamic now. I think the opportunity set is, 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 is better now for, for, for fund managers, but I think at the end of the day, it's it's got to be a segment that you really have some personal passion about because, you know, every day is not a sunny day. Right. And <laughs> and, and it's got to be something that at the end of the day gives you a, gives you enough purpose to go through the challenges that you are going to go through. There's no way around it. You're going to go through challenges if you're trying to get into the fund management business and then start as that emerging fund manager. If you're like a it, we're like a startup. And the thing I always say to our portfolio companies is we're just like you guys, like we're having the same challenges, you know, as a, as a small, as a small business. But the thing I would say to you though, is that um, if it's something that you really care about, you really, you're really passionate about, there may be a need in the market, but the, you know, as long as you feel like you're going to have the staying power to really stay with whatever that mission is um, you just need a couple of uh, folks around you who can, can really kind of buy into what your mission is. And then you can kind of start to build out from there. That, that, that to me, I find is really, is really powerful. If it's something that, well, I'm kind of lukewarm about it. And if like, if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll go get a job. And, and you keep kind of, you know, kind of walking that fence. It's going to be really hard to make those commitments that you have to. And that's one thing. And then, and then I think another thing too, that, that is important. And, and the Kellogg folks have been tremendously helpful for this is, I was on a panel once and, and talking about all the great things we were doing for these black owned businesses. And someone said, well, who's doing that for you guys? And it's like, it was like silence. It was like, you know, like, yeah, it's a good question. Right. Um, and so I think at the same time, I think for us, you know, if there was a lesson learned, you know, we needed to continue to find sponsors and supporters for us and the work that we're doing to help us the same way in which we are helping our portfolio companies. And so I think if you begin to approach it from that perspective, um, I think that there's, there's a good runway right now to really put vehicles in place to address social issues. Thank you, David. And we are almost at time here. So I might invite um, Tim to um, offer a closing statement um, and then I will, uh, I will close us out here. Is there any final parting wisdom, uh, Tim, that you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up? No, I mean, I, again, I, I I would just say that we, we believe and we've proven right that that the the, the uh, we believe the key to um, increasing um, inclusivity and spreading the wealth and raising people up is actually reducing barriers to our current educational system, and that also includes funding, right? And so solid fundamental training, solid funding mechanism, um, a shorter pathway that works is really what we believe is the key to um, improving people's lives. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm going to bring us to a close here. This has been a really quick um, and super energizing uh, 45 minutes here and flew by. Um, I just wanted to, to um, wrap us up here um, by really reiterating that uh, this is a critical moment um, with more capital flowing towards advancing racial equity and shifting power. And as investors and change agents, we must all continue to rethink and redefine risk to dismantle the false narratives that perpetuate 
perceived risks of investing in Black, Indigenous, and people of color and women. And we hope that the stories and successes of our panelists um, uh, that our panelists shared will really inspire more investors uh, to support fund managers who are reaching entrepreneurs and people of color in unique ways and to invest in entrepreneurs directly um, who are disrupting the system. Uh, so again, thank you, Malin, David, and Tim for sharing your wisdom with us today. Uh, we really enjoyed um, this conversation and a huge thank you to SOCAP and all of you in the audience for joining us today. And we hope you all enjoy the rest of the virtual convening. So thank you all.